responsible for effect or and the calculi's by a category theoretic logical relation, um, and the talk is going to be given by Philip Savile. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, so I'm just going to dive straight in because it's a bit of a, a mouthful in the title by telling you what this this work is about. So this is the one sentence summary of it: um, is that it's a category theoretic construction which takes in a model of an effectual lambda calculus and returns a model that's both adequate and fully abstract. And so what I'm going to try and do in the next 20 minutes. is to explain to you what this means and sort of how you can go about doing it, which means I need to explain to you what I mean by adequacy and full abstraction, what I mean by an adequate, by an effective lambda calculus, and what I, some intuitions about how this category theoretic construction works. Okay, so start off with some standard bits uh, there in the literature, but it's, it's nice to be, make sure we're all on the same page before we go into more complicated things. Um, so, Suppose we have some language which has a, a notion of contextual equivalence attached. So this is our way of reasoning about programs. Um, as is well known, it's quite difficult to reason about contextual equivalence because of this quantification over all closed contexts, closed ground contexts. So one approach to dealing with this is to uh, look at semantic models instead, where you assign to every program its semantic interpretation in these kind of brackets. Um, and now instead of just thinking about contextual equivalence, I can compare the interpretations of programs. So I can say, um, whether or not the interpretation of M is the same as the interpretation of M prime in some model. And then just as in you have kind of soundness and completeness in logic, you're interested in the extent to which your model, so the semantic interpretation, is characterizing your contextual equivalence. And just like you have soundness and completeness, we have these two directions, which are, are called adequacy and full abstraction. Uh, adequacy is generally proven by some kind of logical relations argument. There's pretty standard techniques for proving this, um, but full abstraction turns out to be pretty difficult. And that's the, the main focus of this paper. But the kind of dream scenario is where you have both adequacy and full abstraction, because just like in a sound and complete model in logic, that means that your semantic equality is completely characterizing your syntactic notion, which in this case is contextual equivalence. Um, it's worth saying at this point that one way to build uh, a fully abstract model is to take the syntax, uh, build a model out of it, and then quotient by some version of the contextual equivalence relation. This is generally considered an unsatisfactory way to build these kind of adequate fully abstract models because um, in that case your semantic equality ultimately reduces to contextual equivalence and then you've got contextual equivalence characterizing contextual equivalence which is um, not necessarily what you're aiming for when you're doing these kind of things. Okay now a lot of the work on um, full abstraction has focused on um, PCF like languages and this goes back to Plotkin's uh, seminal paper in which he shows that the domains model for PCF isn't fully abstract, although it is if you add some parallel or construct to it. Um, and this sets off a huge amount of research in this area. Um, but what we're doing here is something slightly different. Um, we're uh, not focusing on recursion, so our language doesn't have recursion, but we do have a generic chromatic effect. Um, and so uh, a difference from work that already appears in the literature is that our construction works for lots of different languages at once, it's sort of parametric in the language that you choose, um, whereas those in the literature are generally tailored to the language that they're studying. So what do I mean by the kind of languages we're talking about? Uh, we uh, specify these languages by just, we bundle the data up into a signature. Um, so you can choose a magnetic effect, you can choose some base types and some effectful operations. You might choose a raise operation, raising exception for some of e, type E for um, E's in some set. Um, some primitives, and um, altogether this data determines a higher order language with products and sums. So uh, if you're familiar with this is Moji's computational meta language we're talking about. Um, and correspondingly, we have a, a very standard syntax, uh, semantics to go with these kind of things, where um, you, which we bundle up into what we call a model. So you have to choose um, a category with enough structure to model the exponentials and the sums and the products. Um, you have to choose a strong monad to model your effect. You have to choose some interpretations of all your base types, and you have to choose some arrows to interpret the operations in the primitives. And just like this gives rise to a, a full language, um, this gives rise to interpretation of every term in the language, which has a, a program now has this type. 
Okay, so now we should be clear on what we mean by this, this sort of all the, the, the kind of basic terms in what we're doing. I can tell you in a little more detail what this work is about, um, which is this. So the idea is that you specify a signature, so you specify a language, and you specify a semantic model, and then subject to some conditions on the uh, base category and on the semantic interpretation, our construction gives you back a fully abstract model of, of the language you specify um, with those chosen constants and, uh, and, and primitives, um, and with also some types. Uh, one of the nice things about the model we construct is that it's uh, concrete over your starting model, which means that maps in this model and maps in your original model are satisfying some conditions. Um, and another nice condition is that the, uh, the conditions that you need for this construction to work are only on the base category and on the interpretation. So once you've got a category that works, for example, set, um, then you can just start looking at different effects that, that will give you lots of different examples very quickly because the conditional interpretations is essentially that you need um, an element, a, a syntactic element, naming every semantic element in your base type. So if you have bool, you need a true and a false naming the two elements interpreting your booleans, for example, which is not that strong a condition to have on the language. So one example of that, um, you might take a simple language here, we've taken a very simple thing with nats and bools and, and the obvious primitives for that, um, and a single operation, which is reading from a one bit global memory cell. So this is a language for read-only state, and it has a very sort of standard semantic model, very simple semantic model, in, in, uh, which is set theoretic. You take the reader monad and the obvious interpretation of all this kind of data, but as pointed out to us by Christina Matachi and Sam Dayton, this model isn't fully abstract. Even though it's very simple, very simple language, um, it's not fully abstract, but you can feed it into our construction and get back a model of a uh, fully abstract model of read-only state. For a different kind of example, you could take a base type of real numbers and the kind of primitives and operations that you use in probabilistic programming, um, together with a semantic model given by the category of quasi borel spaces, which has a really nice probability monad and a very uh, natural interpretation of, of the reals. Um, and from this data, our constructions give you back a fully abstract model of an idealized probabilistic programming language. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what this work is about. And now I'm gonna try and spend the next, you know, 15, minutes or so telling you how it works. So here's the kind of starting observation that um, the common obstruction to full obstruction to full abstraction is usually that your model has more it has morphisms that express behavior that programs can't. So um, in the domains model this is parallel or in that set theoretic uh, example with the reader model that I was talking about earlier, you can define a function which takes in another function, so it's higher order, and intuitively it looks at what that function does in different memory states, which is not something that uh, a program can do in read-only state. You can't hypothesize about what it would happen if the state were different, because it can only work for the state that it's got. And these morphisms, kind of these, these ones that express non-program-like behavior, which I'm calling bad in this talk, just for want of a better word, um, they're generally things that break full abstraction. And so reasoning kind of loosely, we can see why, um, so suppose I've got M and M prime that can text the equivalent, then uh, sort of intuitively that means that um, their in semantic interpretations agree on all program-like inputs. Um, but if I have a bad morphism, one of these things that isn't program-like, then I can feed it into these things that I want to agree all the time and I can force them to disagree. So these kind of extra maps are the ones that break full abstraction. And once you've made this observation, the kind of solution is then to say, well, we want to start with our model and we want to refine it in such a way that we can cut out all of these bad maps. Now, so what I'm going to tell you uh, in the last, anyway, what follows um, is first a general construction for refining models. So this is going to be a construction which you take in, which takes in a model um, and is going to, you can choose what sort of conditions you want to impose on your maps. And this is going to, uh, rule out all the maps that don't satisfy those conditions. And importantly, this is going to happen both at the level of the home sets, so the maps in the, in the, in the category, and in the function spaces sort of internally. Um, and you need both of these, because otherwise uh, a morphism uh, can live in a function space, and you can still use it to distinguish uh, the interpretations of programs. So this, this construction is going to have two stages, one for each of these steps. Um, and then we're going to see how to choose the data to feed into this general construction in such a way that we can remove all the bad morphisms and so get a fully abstract model. Okay, so let's talk about this general construction. The 
starting point is this. So a very natural question is that I've got some category and I want to refine it. So I want to rule out maps that don't satisfy some properties. And an example of this is this category of predicates over set where I pair every object with uh, a predicate, which in this case is just a subset, um, and I restrict to the morphisms preserving the predicates. Now, this category is a kind of refinement of the category of sets, and in particular, the morphisms are now restricted. So if I have maps between W and Z, for example, then in the category of pred, um, I'm not having all the functions, I'm just having those between the carriers which satisfy some extra conditions. And this is something you can do very naturally in a very categorical, in a very categorical way. Um, so we can construct a category called pred M, um, where you pair objects with some notion of relation on the object. And then you restrict to maps preserving the relations. And I've left relation here in inverted commas because the kind of relation you choose you might depend on, on different settings. Um, and there's lots of different choices. So it could be some enemy relations. They could be crypt key relations of varying arity. If you know what they are, we're going to be, that's what's actually uh, running the model that we're using later. Um, and it could be one relation, or it could be many. So for example, in the read-only state example uh, before, to rule out that function I was talking about that, that, that uh, breaks full abstraction, you can take a pair of relations, and pair, so you pair every object with two relations, which correspond to constraining behavior of functions when the memory cell contains zero and when the memory cell contains one. Now, this isn't quite enough. If you just do this, the function spaces remain the same. So um, you also need to restrict what we call concrete relations. And this is a term taken from the Oho-Henrique paper, which inspires this work. Um, and that's sufficient to make sure this, this property also holds at the function spaces. We can make that a little bit more precise. So if we look at this categorically, what we have here is our starting model down here, and we've built a category of relations on it, and then we've restricted to a full subcategory of concrete relations. So we have all the, uh, the maps, and we've restricted to just concrete relations. And what's nice about this is that the function space in this category consists of, so an element of the function space in this category is an element of the HOM set in this category, which means the maps that live in the function spaces here are the maps which preserve the relations, right? This is, so this is what I mean about this internal analyzing this condition um, of, of, uh, of this preservation condition to both the function spaces and the home sets. Now, I said this was a completely categorical construction at the start, um, and it is because all of this data you can choose by choosing the right thing that's sort of hidden on the right hand side of this diagram. So um, oh, I should say first, actually, that uh, we need a monad uh, on this category because we want it to be a model. Uh, we use uh, top top lifting to define a monad up here and then ask for suitable adjunction. This is one of the conditions we need on our base category so that we can get a monad here. So this is a way to get this, uh, uh, this category of concrete relations to have a kind of model structure, which is what we currently want. So yeah, going back to these, these relations, um, I'm not gonna go into it in great detail here, but just uh, I want to point out that all of these different kinds of relations can be obtained by choosing the right vibration of logical relations here. We, we don't need to know what the, the details of what that means at the moment, apart from the fact that it determines the right notion of relation. Um, and then pulling back along a suitable functor. So all of this construction appears in a, in a completely categorical way and you can sort of, by varying these choices, we can uh, vary the kind of relations that we're interested in. So to sum up, this is our general construction. So it takes in a model and it gives you back uh, a new category and a new monad on it in which we've removed some maps from both our, uh, the category itself and from the function spaces where the kind of thing we're removing is determined by what kind of relations we're taking, namely what kind of vibration we take here. Okay, so that's the general construction. Um, and what we're gonna do eventually is we're gonna make our final fully abstract model is gonna be living over here. And it's gonna, the, the question is what kind of relations we have to pick to make this work. So the question now is how do we instantiate this to remove all the bad morphisms? So here's, a, here's a, 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 an observation, right? If a map is definable, so it's interpretation of some term, then it can't be bad because we said the bad morphisms were the ones that did some non-program-like behavior. Um, so this suggests that what we want to do is we want to cut out all the non-definable morphisms. Now, um, this is a, a sufficient condition um, and there's a well-known kind of lemma that you can prove, which just says that actually, if you cut out all the maps that aren't definable, then what you're left with is something fully abstract. 
So the question is then, what relations are sufficient? Because remember, we're using relations to cut morphisms out of our model. What relations are sufficient to guarantee that every morphism is definable? Because that's going to cut out all the bad morphisms, and that's going to give us full abstraction. Fortunately, there's a long tradition of work in this area, and we build on this uh, in the context of the languages we're studying. Um, so you can identify the, the, the morphisms that are definable as exactly those which preserve every logical relation. And for the purposes of the talk, it suffices to know the logical relations, just a family of relations indexed by types, which are compatible with the type and term formers in a suitable way. So um, this is what we want to achieve. And we can see now why this would be sufficient for guaranteeing full abstraction, because, um, oh, sorry, I should say. So then our strategy is to, uh, is to uh, uh, set things up so that every morphism is definable by setting up so that every morphism preserves every logical relation. And the way we do this is we instantiate in the construction that we've given before um, by choosing a set I and an interpretation in this category such that the following two properties hold. First, the objects in this category are going to be pairs of an object in our original category and a family of relations indexed by uh, our, our set I um, subject to concreteness. So this is saying that this is uh, arising via the general construction in which we're choosing an index family of relations. And moreover, um, this is the kind of key property for the construction that if I have some logical relation, which remember is a, a type index family of relations, then I can look at the interpretation in this, in this category, this, this model that I'm constructing. And so I can look at the interpretation of type sigma. And that's going to be a pair of, a, of an object to my base category, my starting category, and a family of relations. And in particular, I want it to be the case that I can choose some I naught in my indexing set I so that I can, the relation I naught, so this R I naught for the interpretation of sigma is exactly the relation at type sigma given by the logical relation. Now, this is sufficient for full abstraction because if I have any morphism of this type in the model I'm constructing, remember this is the monad, so this is going to be the interpretation of a of a, of a program, hopefully, of type, uh, of type sigma, um, then <clears throat> because morphisms preserve all the relations, uh, every one for every i, then this map's going to preserve all the relations. In particular, because it's going to preserve the one i naught, it's going to preserve L sigma, so it's going to preserve this logical relation. And because L is arbitrary here, it's going to preserve every logical relation, which, as we saw before, is sufficient for it to be definable. So every map in this, in this category will be definable, which means that um, the model will be fully abstract by the lemma we saw before. Okay, so the question now is how to set things up so that we can get these conditions to hold. Okay, cool. Um, so let me just run through this. Um, okay, cool. Uh, so I'll just, uh, say quickly that the idea is, I'll, I'll give the intuition for I, is that you choose it so there's a set of logical relations over R over, you choose I to be the set of logical relations over your model, and I naught is just looking up the right relation. Now there's some extra issues with this, and there's some kind of circularities, and um, so you have to be a little bit clever to get around it. I, I won't go into that if I'm, if I'm running out of time. Um, instead, I'll just summarize the construction. So uh, the way you do it is you choose your I in such a way that uh, uh, you can uh, quantify over all relations over your model, and so over all relations over the model that you're constructing. Um, you define your interpretation at base types to get this property that we are talking about earlier at base types. You prove it holds by induction of every type, um, and so every map preserves every logical relation, which is um, sufficient for uh, every map being definable, and hence for full abstraction. So this is the whole picture. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to say anything about it, uh, just to show that it, it, it all works. So now we can sum up what happens. So what this is, is a construction that takes a signature and a well-pointed model, returns a model that's fully abstract. Um, it always holds over set whenever, what, for any choice of monad, as long as there's a name for every element of the interpretation of the base types. And the key ideas are that you cut these bad maps out using this general construction. Um, preserving every logical relation is sufficient to ensure definability, and you avoid this circularity by choosing the index set carefully. Um, there's more things we'd like to do, uh, namely, it would be nice to get rid of the condition for well-pointedness. It'd be nice to uh, generalize the condition for this, this right adjoint that we need to exist, um, and also to uh, cover things on recursion and to examine whether this category arises by some kind of universal property, because it's a, a pullback 
and then a product. So it feels like there's some sort of linked behavior going on. Um, I'll just put my email here. I'm happy to take any questions or so uh, by email now or, uh, or later.